everyone. Welcome to the podcast. I'm Dan Alden and Senior Pastor of Reality Church here in Perth, Western Australia. And I'm so glad you've joined us to get a hold of this week's message. I really believe God wants to do something fresh and powerful in your life. And I'm praying that this message you're about to hear will be a catalyst for that. So enjoy the message. And remember, Jesus is the reality you've been looking for. Okay, look, this is a message that I have struggled with. But I do believe that it is what God wants to speak to us and it is practical and, um, and it hurts because God's been dealing with me um, from the onset. Well, he's been trying to deal with me for many years, <laughs> but from the onset of Christmas, the year just gone, um, you know, the beginning of this year, that's where his finger was on the pulse and it was do or die you know, you obey, you obey me or your health is going to really suffer. And, um, and, and we, because we're talking about health today, we, we're talking about healthy bodies and, you know, for obvious reasons, we want to live a long life. We want quality of life. We want to live a long life for various reasons. We want to see our children's children. We want to leave a legacy to them. So there's so many reasons why we want to avoid being unhealthy and um, be becoming ill and unable to help our family members or our children or our children's children. So that's the whole idea of um, living a healthy life, basically. You know, we, we want to be around to enjoy our children, our grandchildren. And some of you may already know that I've been on a bit of a health journey and, and it's been pretty intense, you know, from the very start of the year. And God didn't just challenge me on my health, but in so many other areas. And, uh, and he reminded me of a dream that I had had um, a few years before. And this dream keeps popping up in my mind. And that dream was, you've got three plastic spoons and one metal one, one real one. And it spoke to me that I was eating three, three unhealthy choices to the one healthy choice and I was getting away with it. But if you're at my age or older, you start to realise that when you get to a certain age, you can't get away with that anymore. You can get away with it when you're young, but as you get older, it starts to catch up on you, amen? And, um, and I'm not talking junk food like Maccas and uh, chicken treat or what, what, Kentucky Fried Chicken. That's not the junk that I was eating. It was cakes. Biscuits. He's forfeiting his cake today. Uh, cheese platters, dips, soft cheeses, uh, antipasto. Too much, too much, too much, too much. And, you know, he spoke one word to me and that was management. And that was at the beginning of the year. The word management was just so um, in my peripheral. And, and it was right in front of me and... He was requiring me to do, make some major changes. Now, I've tried to make changes. I've, I've made many changes. Well, but I've that cosy bed, I keep going back into it. Amen? So managing our health. You know, I love this quote. We need to take care of our body. It's the only place we have to live. That summarises it, doesn't it? So what is management? So management basically is a problem-solving process. It is organising, planning, directing things. You know, for me, it's basically putting things that are out of order in my life back into order, taking a hold of those things. So I'm going to talk about weight today. Disclaimer. You know, at the beginning of the year, um, I was 14 kilos heavier than I am right now. Now, that might be not so much if you're a tall person, because you, you can hide everything. But when you're short, like five foot, there's nowhere for that to hide. It's there. It's there for the world to see. You can't hide it. And, and this is the problem. It's not just the weight. It was the fact that I have high blood pressure issues and high cholesterol. And it was uh, amplifying those issues to the point where I could barely function I'd be dizzy all the time, even on my medication. It, wasn't, it just wasn't uh, working. So God was challenging me to get my health in order, stop overeating, and stop eating all the wrong things. 
And, you know, I, like I said, I've been down this road a few times, but he wanted me to, to apply some discipline. And it's not easy, right? It's not easy. Um, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 to 20 says, Do you not know that your bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honour God with your bodies. Now, if you look up the Hebrew word there for bodies, it's a word called soma, and it means your physical body, not just your spirit man, but your physical body as well. So I want to look at a few keys today that help us to bring... Uh, things into order in our lives. And these are the things that, that I have been challenged with and that God has been working on me. Amen. Being disciplined, key one. And I love this quote, success is the sum of small efforts repeated day in and day out. It's just doing it day in and day out. That's the hard part, right? <laughs> to start eating, eating healthy on a consistent basis is, is not easy. And, you know, I still fall for the chocolate, I'm not going to lie. Someone offers me chocolate, especially if it's rum and raisin. Where, where's Cynthia? I know her habits. <laughs> where's that rum and raisin chocolate, Cynthia? You know, I would be hiding it at the back of the freezer and my kids would still find it and say, Mum, we know. And, you know, it'd be okay if it was just one block. But when it's five, wow. Yeah. So our body's a temple, you know, and it's a dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. And if we are unfit, how on earth are we going to achieve anything in this world for God, let alone just do daily life? Amen? Now, obviously, some health issues are not our making. And, and Jesus came as a healer. You know, in Acts 10, 38, it says, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. So he spent more time on earth doing the miracle, showing that miracle of healing to, to people more than any other miracle. So we we're aware of that. We were aware of that, that God is in the business of healing. And so we understand that sicknesses, diseases and ailments originated in the fall of man and other work of the enemy. You know, you read about Job and all the disasters and the sicknesses that came upon him. The devil came to sift him. It was all the work of the enemy. But there is a place where we are our worst enemy and we're shooting ourselves in the foot. And that's exactly what I was doing with my life. That's the cold, hard fact. Especially if he heals us. I don't even count how many times I've stood up here and said I've been healed of high blood pressure but then gone back into my lifestyle and the whole thing has come back around the mountain again so there's a place where we need to take responsibility amen anyway I started walking and I've been down that road for a while but then but never in a disciplined way until the beginning like I said the beginning of this year I started to jog me and jogging no but me and jogging. And do you know, it's since I've been doing that, that things have changed in my life. Finish my work, have a routine, and I go for a jog. Do you know what? I love to jog now. I actually love to jog. And I think um, Robert and Vicky caught me jogging one day at the park. <laughs> that was embarrassing. You know, because back then I was still... <laughs> like, it's embarrassing. You know, you sound like the dogs that have been walked down the park because you're so unfit and you, you're breathing like an elephant. And, uh, but anyway, I'm past that to the point where I love to go for a jog and I never thought I'd see the day when I were well, here the day I'd say that. Amen. And, and I haven't arrived. I'm saying that I'm still working on things. I still have to fight some bad habits. And, but you know, I have more energy than I've had since I was a child. And when I was in Japan, I was going up those mountains like I was Rocky Balboa. <laughs> My kids were saying, we can't keep up with your mum. And they're supposed to be the fit, young, healthy ones. Amen. I need the Rocky music playing right now. <laughs> Key two, changing our mindsets. You know, I love this quote. Food is an important part of a balanced diet. We live in such a 
crazy diet focused world. It's incredible. Diets for this, diets for that. But really, we need to come back to that place where we think of healthy food as delicious, enjoyable, sustainable, and, and, and the, the right way to live instead of this diet crazy plans that we can come up with. And, you know, it's been proven that some of these extreme diets, uh, low calorie restrictive diets, will cause you to be anxious, irritable, frustrated, and depressed. Well, I've been on those. <laughs> I've been on a few of those. And, you know, if I'm snapping at my kids every left, right, and center, what's the point of that? That's not quality of life at all. The key to success is to find a way to make healthier choices without starving or eliminating the foods you love. Everything in moderation, in its balance, in its place. Don't have three plastic spoons and one steel one. Um, and you know, the health journey isn't all thorns. God knows your favorite things. He knows what you My One of my most favorite things is curry samosas. And I'm on this, you know, three months into my health plan and I get a call from Lucy Brown. Are you here, Lucy? Amen, she'll testify to this testimony. And she goes, Tanya, I was making samosas, homemade ones. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, Tanya loves samosas, make, make her some. And so she goes, do you like curry samosas? I said, I love curry samosas, hallelujah. Do you know, God knows how to reward us when we're sticking to the plan. And he encouraged me so much. You know, she said, God must love you, Tanya, that he's making you some curry samosas. And, you know, the funniest part about that story, that's not all that happened. This is a bit of a sideline. I had to rush down to Allenbrook to pick up my curry samosas. And, um, and I had my GPS going. I didn't know where she, where she was. And my GPS took me off the main drag and then around the block. I thought, oh, okay, we're nearly there. And then back onto the main drag. And I thought, that's weird. What, what's going on with this? I'm yelling at my GPS. Like, Stupid GPS. What's, I'm in a hurry. I'm going to get back to an art class. And this thing is taking me off. the. So I picked up my samosas, thanked her, thanked the Lord. Amen. Got back into my car and then back on that road. The GPS was doing the right thing, but I came to that place where I'd gone off the road and there was a major car accident. And, you know, God directs our paths, even to pick up my curry samosas. How good is God? That devil's trying to rob me of my curry samosas. They're all gone now, by the way. He knows our favourite things. He's not telling us not to have them. He's telling us to be moderate. Amen. Okay, so there's a nasty word. I, I couldn't even bring myself to put it as a title today. So I'm just going to say it real quick. Gluttony. <laughs> Gluttony, okay. What is it? It's simply being excess, over excessive with food or drink, being overfed. And the dictionary defines it as a, a glutton, as one who is given habitually to greedy and ferocious eating. That sounds like me, yes. You know, we think of addictions as, um, you know, immediately we think of alcohol, we think of drugs, we think of, uh, you know, cigarettes. But food like, and, and drinks and, and coffee and Coke, they can become obsessions just as much as any of those other things. Sugar has been known to be super addictive and our world is filled with products that are highly enthused with sugar. So our stomachs can rule us and it, our stomachs can be our God. In Philippians 3.19, it says their end is destruction. Their God is their belly with minds set on earthly things. You know, the truth is I could be a size six or seven today and still have a problem with gluttony. It's not about how, what size you are. It's about the habit. It's about the mindset you know, just because you have a high metabolism and it, it doesn't show does not mean we're exempt from that spirit of gluttony. 
Gluttony will cause us to be food focused more than God focused, more than people focused. Uh, we won't care about what's going on around us. Um, we'll eat more than is right to put on our plate. I'm, I'm talking to myself here, okay? So please don't get offended. Um, you eat when you're not even hungry. You eat when you're not even hungry. And do you know, we don't even know when we feel hungry because we're just going from one meal to the next meal to the next meal. In, that's the society we live in. So overeating any kind of food, good or bad, nutritious or junk, is still gluttony. Um, and look how many times that this word pops up in scriptures is actually really scary. Ezekiel 16.49, Sodom's sins were pride, gluttony and laziness while the poor and needy suffered outside the door. Proverbs 23, 2, put a knife to your throat if you are a man or woman of great appetite. So gluttony may seem, yeah, it's hard stuff, <sighs> straight in the heart. Gluttony may seem less of a transgression to all the others, but it's just mentioned too many times. And the problem is, this is the era we live in. We can't see that it's an issue. And I couldn't see it was an issue. It's, it's a lifestyle that, that we are in, ingrained in our lives. We need to get back to being producers instead of just consumers all the time. Self-control, key three. You may have to fight a battle more than once to win it, and boy, do I know that. Self-control, if you can't control our appetite, how can we control anything else in our life? It starts with those small things. Proverbs 25, 27, it's not to... To, um, good to eat too much honey. Well, I looked at that and thought, well, but honey's good for you. It's the best thing. It's medicinal. It's this. Not too much honey. You know, it's still got the sugar content. It's still um, going to cause problems. And then the scripture straight after that is a person without self-control is like a city with walls broken down. Well, amen. That's me. And I because my dad has beekeepers come to the farm and they do canola honey, there's honey aplenty at my dad's property in big buckets like this. And every time I'd go there, I'd fill up my containers full of honey. Now, I'm not saying honey is a bad thing. I'm just saying excess, right? You get that. You know, growing up on the farm, uh, it, it created a... a a spirit of gluttony because we wouldn't be served our food on a plate. We would be given blank plates all around the table, all six of us, and the food would be put in the middle of the table and there'd be casseroles, roast, veggies, piles, piles. So we wouldn't just have one helping. We'd have two. We could go back for three. We could go back for four helpings if we wanted more gravy. We were gluttonous. And then came the sweets. Then the sweets. Now, that might sound great to all of you. It was like Sizzlers before Sizzlers was even invented. My mum was a fantastic cook and she loved to cook and she loved to see us eat. She loved it. But you can see where the issue began, right? You can see it. And you know that feeling when you've overeaten and all you want to do is sleep. <laughs> it's okay if it's Christmas Day or a wedding feast those one-off occasions when it's a, a right thing, we've got to get it into balance, amen? But if we mismanage our bodies, ultimately our health is going to be affected. Proverbs 23, 21, For the heavy drinker and the glutton will come to poverty, and drowsiness or sleepiness will clothe a man with rags. And it's just interesting doing this study that there's such a common thread with gluttony linking it with laziness, sleepiness and poverty. Okay? And, and Psalm 78 gives us a glimpse of God's view regarding his people and their attitude towards food. This is the Israelites in the wilderness, and he had provided them manna, but then they started to crave meat and more, more, something more. And it says, um, but they continued to sin against him, rebelling in the wilderness and against the Most High. They willfully put God to the test by demanding the food they craved. So you know the story, God brings the wind and he brings the quail, and there's so much... Um, of that, that they eat themselves crazy. But it just highlights their rejection of God's provision of manna because they wanted something more, they wanted something different, they wanted something better, and they were just driven by that. They complained and they got what they asked for only to vomit it up later. What's the point of that? Sometimes we have to recognize 
The restraints the Lord is putting on us for a reason and for a season. Those restraints are to bring down, you know, for me, my blood pressure. For me, my cholesterol. I had to receive those restraints and show some self-control. And, you know, some of the crises that arrived in my life um, are because I was out of order. I'd blame the devil when God was trying to bring correction to me. It's a hard word to even speak this stuff. I had to allow him to step into my life and bring that correction. So key four is allow God's correction. Don't be too high and mighty to, to receive his correction. Amen? And it says, this quote is, don't hesitate to be corrected because correction is the best medicine for progress. Amen? So... So we understand that a crisis can be the direct result of our mismanagement and the only way to correct it is through management. Amen? If we're continually hitting crisis after crisis, we need to take back our lives and take control. I just want to take you to this, another scripture in Genesis 2.5 before man had been created. It says, No shrubs had grown in the meadow of the, of the earth and no vegetation had sprouted because the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth and there was no human beings to work or manage the ground. Now it says no shrubs, no growth, no vegetation had sprouted as no humans had been created to tend it. And you know what I get from that scripture? Is that God never allows growth where there is no management. We can hit a roof. Everything can just stop. That flows through to business, family, not just our health. Amen. God had to show me not just in that area of health, but also business, that instead of praying for things, pray for that management ability instead. You know, God actually withholds from us things if we cannot manage it. So, you know, it's like, don't pray for a new house while your apartment's looking like a dog's breakfast. You know, <laughs> yes, there is grace. Yes, there is his favour and his many blessings and we've experienced that. But our Heavenly Father is also a loving Father and he disciplines us. Just like we do when our kids are out of order in their rooms or, or a mess. Amen? We, we expect something from them and we've trained them. Hebrews 12, 5 to 7. And have you forgotten the exhortation, the addresses that, you, that addresses you as sons? So what's that exhortation? It's this. My son, do not take lightly the discipline of the Lord and do not lose heart when he rebukes you. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and he chastises everyone he receives as a son. So it says, enduring suffering as discipline, God is treating you as sons. For what son is not disciplined by his own father? And he loves us. That's why he brings the discipline. You know, we discipline our kids by withholding something from them as a consequence for certain actions. We're doing them a favour. And we're doing our society a favour because they're going to grow up respectful kids. Amen? Even when we hold, withhold the sweets. Too much. One only. Dan, yes. Pastor Dan. <laughs> I'm seeing that cake, Pastor Dan. I'm just wondering if you're eating that all by yourself today. Okay, so we've got to let the management flow through every area of our lives. And the one thing that God blessed me with was, um, you know, a lovely home where I live right now. And, and after living in that squishy tin unit for so many years, and that faith battle got me out of there. But, you know, every day I was in that place, I kept it clean as much as I could, even though it was so squishy. And, and God gave me an upgrade. You know, he gives us the upgrade. He sees what you're doing. You're, you're taking care of what some, belongs to somebody else. It's not mine. It belonged to somebody else. But if we take care of what belongs to somebody else, he'll give us something more. Amen? Now, my girls think I'm over the top with my cleaning, but the house I'm in now, I know God gave me that house because if you heard my testimony about the miracles that happened for me to get in there, God gave me that house. And boy, oh boy, I'm going to keep it squeaky. Amen. You still love me, right? So his upgrades come when we manage the things we have right now, our businesses, our health, our apartments, or what, what's in your hand now that you can manage right now. Just the simple things. Even if it's uh, for children, you know, taking care of the pets, 
cleaning out the food bowls, feeding the pets, cleaning out the trays, whatever it is. But I had to ask myself, what has he already told me to put in order? And, you know, if you're feeling stationary right now, you've got to go back to what he previously told you. So God always gives you what you've already proven you can manage. And so if we mismanage our bodies, we'll lose it. It's the same thing for everything else. You know, I can continually blame the devil for stuff that was my mismanagement. And God really challenged me to put certain things in order, even in my business. And I know this is crossing over from health, but I have to, as a testimony to, to what God has been doing in this walk, in this season for me. You know, if I'm not organised and I run late putting up my holiday program, guess what? I don't have any students sitting on those seats. I learnt the hard way, manage it, manage it, manage it. Put that time in, put that effort in. Prep your holiday program way before the holidays begin. Amen? Five, number five, taking responsibility. So God gives us responsibility. He gives us uh, ears. (laughs) He gave them when you were born, but that's okay. He gives us areas to manage, spheres to manage, and he's there to help us all the way. You know, and it says, ask him. It says, if you lack wisdom, in James 1, 5, it says, if you lack wisdom, ask God and he'll give you generously without rebuke. He won't treat you like an idiot. He's happy to give you a plan. He's happy to show you the way of what you need, how to start your your walk, your plan. Okay, key six. It's kind of contradictory to what Pastor Brooke preached last um, week, which was rest. This is hard work. We have moments to rest, but we have moments where we need to work hard. It's like going to the gym. You know, if we put our effort into what we're doing for our boss, he's going to love us because we're putting 100% effort in and it's like a workout. Amen? And I can't go to the gym if my house is a wreck because if I get, get to the gym and my house is a mess, what's the point of that? But I'm at the gym when I'm pushing that vacuum cleaner around and I'm wax on, wax off. I'll be like cry to kid. The point is, it is a workout to do your house, to keep it in order. Amen? Save your money. Cancel your gym membership. Oh, someone just whispered heresy. Okay. Obviously, if you work in an office, you're going to need some, some little bit of gym, Kurt. <laughs> you know, you'll feel great and you would feel like you've achieved something just by doing that, that whole routine through your house. It'll make you feel good. You know, when I lived in Vanuatu, I noticed all the local islanders are very poor people, but they were buff. And I'm thinking, there's gyms in Port Villa? Like, how are these guys all so buff? And all the women, they were buff, you know? But we lived right on the edge and if you, of, the, of Port Villa Bay and you could look out across the river, uh, across the bay, and you could see why they were buff. They would pull in the uh, fish with nets and stuff like that and then they would be macheteing through, through jungle to get wild banana and all this sort of thing. Everything they did was about food and to, to survive, and that's why they were so buff. And if you think about um, in Jesus' day, it's the same deal. They walked hundreds and hundreds of kilometres. They didn't have diesel power winches to help pull up the nets. And Jesus was a carpenter. You start from chopping that tree down, that's physical exercise right there, and then carving a piece of furniture, it's all manual Okay, so how we conduct ourselves in front of our children is is so important. You know, Eli the priest had two rebellious sons and God speaks to him through the prophet and, and says to Eli, why do you scorn my sacrifice and offering and why do you honour your sons more than me by fattening yourselves on the choice parts of every offering made by my people Israel? You know, so Eli is warned about the fact that they were consuming most of the sacrifice that had been um, roasted and and so the prophet's trying to bring that hard line and even Samuel as a young prophet brings another word so he's warned even um, twice or three times about this but then after that the ark gets taken and his sons are killed 
And when, um, and he's sitting on a bench when the prophet comes to tell him that the ark has been taken, and he falls backwards and breaks his neck and dies. And it says he was a heavy, weighty man. You know, our children are watching our food habits, and they follow. And they conduct, if we conduct ourselves that way, they will follow. So Eli was in, in fault. You know, he, he didn't model a good eating pattern and, and he failed dismally in the task. Okay, key seven, fasting. I love this one. Jesus lived a lifestyle of fasting and fasting is not only of spiritual benefit, but it's also a physic, it's physically beneficial. You know, you notice all the health gurus now of this day and age that don't even know God, they, they've cottoned on to the benefits of fasting. Amen? And, and some of this stuff I didn't even know until I started this research um, that fasting brings on the process of autophagy. And what autophagy is, is the body's way of cleaning out damaged cells in order to regenerate newer, healthier cells. So fasting gives our bodies time to cleanse and to reset plus all our spiritual benefits of drawing close to the Lord. It promotes healthy blood sugar levels. It enhances health, um, heart health by improving blood pressure and cholesterol levels, yay. Boosts brain function and prevents neurodegenerative disorders like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. These are proven facts. And the most outstanding thing I find is that scientists have show that the body uses most of its energy to break down the food we eat. So when we stop eating and our body goes into autophagy, guess what it's doing? It's concentrate on healing. That's what it's doing. It has time, space to go to every area in your body and promote healing. It's fantastic. The body is fantastic. And it's been proven, there's been cases with cancer has been healed when a person's gone on a fast. People with stomach problems have been healed when they've gone on a fast. I'm not talking Christians here, I'm just talking general people that have been told, go on a fast and see what happens. You know, what I find interesting is that the, the original first sin, the original sin in the Garden of Eden had to do with being tempted by food that was specifically they were told not to eat. That was the original sin. If you break it right down, it was don't eat that. But they ate what was forbidden. But fasting is like the reversal. Okay? It was withholding from eating to draw closer to God and build up our spirit man and all the added physical benefits that come with it that we've just talked about. And I don't know if you've ever noticed that, but this, but when I go on a fast, I find that if I can control that, other areas in my life are so much more controllable. Amen? Amen. Not much clapping today, but that's okay. <laughs> Rent a crowd didn't turn up. <laughs> I'll just keep the money. What does God consider a true fast? As, as us as Christians, it's not just the act of fasting, it's the act of our heart. It says this in Isaiah 58, 7 and 8. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry while you're fasting? Bring, bring the poor and homeless into your home to clothe the naked when you see them and not turn away from your own flesh and blood. Then your light will break forth like the dawn and your healing will come quickly. Your righteousness will go before you and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. What a speedy healing promise that is right there. Speedy. Okay, so let's talk about specifically um, attaining long life. If you have good health, guess what? You are going to live long. The word is full of spiritual keys and promises that we can stand on that will guarantee long life. So we know that death is the devil's plan. And abundant life is the Lord's plan. It says the devil comes to kill, to steal, to destroy. And the Lord comes to give life and give it in abundance. He is a pro-life God. Amen. They are polar opposites, what the enemy wants to do and what, and what God wants to do. But you know what? The devil loves it when we lack self-control because we make his job easier. Because we indulge, we overindulge in this lifestyle. 
Key eight, his presence. Long life comes through two things, managing our physical bodies, which we've just discussed, but also being in the presence of God regularly in intimate fellowship with him. There's something about being in the presence that changes things physically as well as spiritually. In Psalm 91, 16 says, With long life I will satisfy you and show you my salvation. And that salvation covers deliverance, aid, victory and prosperity. Um, The psalm is also about the secret place in God, you know, being under the shadow of his wing, protected from harm, protected from premature death. You know, it's called a secret place because the devil can't find you. He can't find you there. And it's not a place that you visit. It's a place you dwell. Amen? So... The presence of God affects us spiritually and physically. It does something to your molecular structure. You know, Moses' face shone when he'd been in the presence. You know, us women would love a complexion glowing like that. That sounds good to me. A glowing complexion. But, you know, even though he was old, um, 120 I think it says he was, his eyes never grew dim. And his natural vigour never faded. And the only thing that he was doing different to everyone else was he was spending a lot of time in the presence of God. Amen? Waiting in his presence. When you are feeling run down, especially single mums here in the building today, you know that feeling when you just, you just feel like you can't lift your head from the struggles of life. Or just if your partner is away and you're on your own with your little ones, it, the 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 word teaches us to wait because waiting is beyond that praying realm. It's, it's a place of intimacy and communion. And in that place, his presence restores us, body, soul, and spirit. Isaiah 43, 31 says, They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They will mount up with wings as eagles. They will run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. What an awesome promise. And, you know, there's even health and beauty scriptures. We're going to tap into this Bible. It's full of beauty scriptures, ladies. Psalm 41.11. He is the health of my countenance. Looking good. In Job it says, My flesh is fresh as a child's and I've been restored to the days of my youth. Pray that one over your life. Amen. You know, speak to your stem cells. Do you know we have power in in our words? We can speak to our stem cells and tell them to regenerate. Amen? And you know, when you're fasting, that's what happens too. Your stem cells are regenerating while you're fasting. A proven scientific fact. And if you're needing a facelift today, Thou, O Lord, are a shield about me and the lifter of my face. Hallelujah. You know, Sarah, Abraham's wife, you know, I always found this very fascinating that a king and a pharaoh, when they saw her, they wanted her. She was beautiful. She was 65 years of age. We're missing something. Few scriptures. Apply that. Amen. So like I was saying, words have power. It says in Proverbs 16, 24, talks about pleasant words bringing healing to us. Pleasant words are a honeycomb sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. Watching what we speak, what we say, let it be tempered with love and peace and patience. Proverbs 16.22 talks about not losing sight of the words of wisdom you have been taught. It says, keep them within your heart for they are life to those who find them and health to the whole body. I just want to finish with this one. And there's many, many more. But honouring our parents for long life, it's, it's a commandment that comes with a powerful promise. So Ephesians 6, 2, it says, Honour your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may have long life on the earth. How powerful is that? You know, even if our parents weren't the model parents, maybe they let us down. Honouring is a bit like forgiving. It benefits you. 
It's helpful to you. Amen. Now, I really hope this speaks to you today and that it's a turning point, even if it's a little turning point. Well, hey, thanks for joining us on the podcast today. We trust that God is doing something incredible in your life. And if you'd like to find out more about Reality Church or you want to find out more about having a relationship with God, head over to our website, myreality.church, and you can find out everything there. If you're in Perth, we would love to meet you. So come join us at a service on a Sunday. You can find all the details at our website, myreality.church. We hope to see you soon.